Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Judith Thompson's Hedda Gabler, which is an adaptation of the Ibsen play. Now, for full disclosure, uh, while I have read several Ibsen plays and have seen at least one production of A Doll's House, I have not actually read his Hedda Gabler, so I don't... I know the, the broad storylines, but for the most part, I don't have a great sense of how different Thompson's version is from Ibsen's, with one major exception. <laughs> one major thing that I know she has changed. So, Hedda Gabler is a difficult play for me to sort of wrap my head around. Um, largely because I'm not entirely clear what it is that Hedda actually wants. She drives most of the conflict here because this is one of Ibsen's domestic plays like a doll's house where everything takes place within the home and there are these i mean this is realist theater this is 19th century realism um and so there are domestic issues there are financial issues there are professional issues there are gender politics and things like this all taking place within the space of the home and exploring the challenges of women's experience in this sort of 19th century setting where women don't particularly have rights, they don't particularly have uh, careers outside the home, etc., etc. Hedda Gabler is a tricky woman for me to wrap my head around because. It seems like primarily what she wants is power over others, but there doesn't seem to be anything in particular she wants to do with that power. So, like, she wants a certain degree of power over her husband. She wants, um, she wants power over her former lover who's now her husband's rival for or perceived rival for an academic job um eilert loveborg she wants power over her former classmate and now rival for loveborg's affections thea elvsted she wants power over judge brack uh who's their family. Um, so her husband is George Tessman. Um, Judge Brack is the Tessmans' sort of financial planner slash patron, and she wants power over him. But she has no real aim, as far as I can tell. Like she, that she doesn't necessarily want anything. She isn't trying to achieve a particular goal. She doesn't want social status or influence or anything like this necessarily she just seems to want power in itself so i it it feels to me like there there needs to be something more to this character than just someone who wants power and manipulates others in an attempt to get it for its own sake i mean it's such a famous play it's such a well-regarded play it seems to me it just it, it i don't know i'm having trouble with the idea that there's not something more to her than that and i mean we do get these indications i mean there's a feminist component to it because like when thea first shows up she tells Hedda, or really Hedda manipulates her into telling her um, that Thea has left home because her husband basically was, was domestically abusing her. Again, late 19th century. This is not that uncommon, unfortunately. But Hedda says, from, from father's house to husband's house, dungeon to dungeon, hmm? 
and we get that that sort of idea reiterated later that like domestic life is a kind of prison and i'm willing to go along with that feminist critique i think i think especially in the 19th century but even still to today there there are massive problems with the way that domestic life is is arranged in much, in many western cultures but Hedda's response to this, Hedda's response to Thea's plight is not sort of feminist solidarity. It's essentially, I am also going to manipulate you and abuse you and insult you. Like, Hedda threatens to burn this woman's hair repeatedly. Um, she repeatedly insults her and commands her to do things. So... I don't know. It, I mean, I, I I have a hard time seeing this as a as a, a really feminist story per se, even though there are elements here that hint at feminism. It really does seem like Hedda is trying to establish power over others, almost purely for the sake of. pulling the strings, pu being the puppet master. And, I don't know, her her attempts to do this, one of the big things, one of the big weird things about her attempts to do this is um, with Loveborg, her, for for her, her former lover, now her husband's perceived rival, um, so Loveborg and Thea have written this brilliant, paradigm-changing manuscript together. Loveborg loses it. Loveborg gets drunk and loses it. Um, and so the drunkenness is a, is, a, is a part... Like, the drunkenness plays into Hedda's weird fantasy, this weird sort of romantic fantasy... Because she pictures, so she basically manipulates him into going out to this party that he doesn't want to go to because he's a recovering alcoholic and he recognizes that going out and drinking is not going to be a good thing. He's, a, he's an alcoholic and apparently quite violent, very, very little self-control and things like this. So Hedda manipulates him into going to this party where he gets drunk, um, he loses the manuscript, and Hedda's husband, uh, Tessman, picks it up and brings it back, gives it, basically gives it to Hedda, slash she takes it from him. Thea is waiting at the Tessmans' house for Loveboard to come back and to walk her home. And Hedda keeps bringing up this image of him drunk and like shining with vi vines of leaves and ivy and whatever in his hair and this like sort of romantic classical image and it's a weird thing that she's so insistent on that but we then later find out that in fact when Loveboard got drunk, he like went to a brothel and had sex with a bunch of prostitutes and then started smashing the place up and then attacked two policemen and they had to get a bunch of guys to restrain him and throw him in jail. So it's like this she had has got this like weird romantic fantasy that she tries to manipulate him into, and it it completely fails. And after he sort of realizes that he's lost this manuscript, and so Loveborg comes back to their house and, 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 and tells Thea that he destroyed the manuscript. Hedda knows that's not true because she's got it. Loveborg then, after Thea leaves, Loveborg then says... To Hedda, actually, I just lost it. And she's like, well, you should probably go kill yourself. Here's a gun. 
kill yourself beautifully. So she's, again, she's got this like weird romantic fantasy of him like going and, I don't know, committing noble suicide in some Goethe-style gesture. Um, and he doesn't. I mean, he goes and he kills himself, but he goes back to this brothel where he had torn the place up and things like this. And he shoot, the judge is not very specific about where he shoots himself. Um, the judge does say he shoots himself in the chest. Hedda assumes he means the heart, and so she reads that as a romantic gesture, and he says, mm, not really the heart. He shot himself lower than that. So, I mean, there's sort of an implication that he shot himself in, in the genitals, but that's not necessarily a fatal wound, so I don't know. Um, that's an extraordinarily unpleasant wound, but it's not necessarily fatal. It might be the stomach, it might be the liver, it's... The judge is not specific, but it's clearly not something that's like a romantic hero in despair taking his own life in this sort of sublime way. And so Hedda actually has this line. She says, everything I touch becomes vile and ludicrous. And I mean, that's true in a way. I mean, it's... Like, she fails repeatedly to manipulate people the way that she wants to. She fails repeatedly to get them into her power. And so, I don't know. I mean, again, I just, I have trouble with this character because it feels like... I don't really see what's admirable about her. And I guess I just have trouble with the idea that she's a completely unadmirable, barely sympathetic character, and yet it's a great, popular, classic play. I don't know. I mean, there's probably more to it, and I'm probably missing some component of it, but I guess I'm, I guess in a way I'm sort of thinking about her in contrast to Nora from A Doll's House, because Nora actually has some admirable qualities. She makes mistakes, yeah, she, she has sort of tragic errors, but she's got some ethically admirable qualities, and I'm just not seeing many of those in Hedda. But the last thing I want to talk about, um, with Thompson's version of Hedda Gabler is the ending. Because this is one of the places where Thompson has made a very distinct and purposeful change from Ibsen. So in Ibsen's version, Hedda Gabler basically goes off stage. She's obsessed with guns, by the way. In every in every act of this play, she talks about guns, she plays with guns, she shoots guns just randomly. Um, at the end of Ibsen's version, Hedda goes back into her bedroom or the back room or something like that and shoots herself in the head. Um, and the characters initially think she's just shooting because she's obsessed with guns. But then they go back and realize that she's actually killed herself. In Thompson's version... We get some stage directions. So she's now... So by this point, Loveborg has, has let her down. He has not lived up to her romantic fantasies. Um, Tessman and Thea are sort of working together to recreate Loveborg's lost manuscript. The judge, because he knows that Loveborg killed himself with Hedda's gun now has leverage over her, and basically he's going to extort sex from her. So she is now basically lost in this, in all of these power games that she's trying to play. 
And so, according to the stage directions, uh, she removes her jacket and reaches for the gun. She just had a gun on her, her writing table or something. Hedda aims the gun at her head. She shoots herself. She falls to her chair. Bertha enters. Bertha's the maid, by the way. Tasman and Thea stand. Thea picks up the candelabra from the desk. Tasman says, oh, she's playing with those pistols again. He runs to the back room. He says, oh my god, she shot herself in the... Brack throws his magazine to the floor. Brack says, oh no, no, good god, please, people don't do things like that. So that's the end here. Like, so... Thompson has taken what Ibsen does off stage and put it on stage. And so we actually see Hedda kill herself in a way that we don't in Ibsen. And I think that is really, really significant. Um, because, I mean, this may be the one moment where she really genuinely becomes sympathetic she sort of recognizes that she's lost across the board. She's lost all of these sort of power games she's attempted to play. And she decides that this is the only way out. But I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm still not terribly sympathetic because I don't know. I guess it's that she's put herself in this position so much that I just have a very difficult time really sympathizing with her. And maybe that's my own sort of short-sighted reading of the play, but 